number five is the book with seven seals. This book, God saw it, it's in heaven. Now, God himself is sitting on the throne. In his right hand, he's a holding of this book. This book is written within, and on the outside, it's sealed with seven seals. Now, in the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about this sealed book. This book was sealed from, uh, from the beginning of eternity up till now. This book will be sealed up till chapter number 5 of the book of Revelation. Now, keep in mind the Lord Jesus, this is future events. He's not broken the seals off of this seven sealed book yet. One of these days, uh, after we're going to heaven to be with the Lord. Now, uh, the church is mentioned here not by name, but the elders in this chapter, that's the typical of the church, were around the throne at that time. Uh, the Lord called us home. I believe and we're over there. And it's getting ready for the great tribulation period to set in. And what kicks that off will be the Lord gracious. Verse number one, John said, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne of book, written within, and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. This is what John saw. Verse number one. Now the theme of this chapter is the church in heaven with Christ. But in verse number one, we see the book of woe. This is the book of woe. In Ezra chapter number 2 and verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, When I look, behold, and hand sent, and hand uh, sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written within lamentations and mourning and woe. That's what's coming out of this sealed book. Daniel chapter number 12 and verse number 4 tells us it's a sealed book. And that it'll be sealed under the old Revelation chapter number 5. And he's telling us what's written within this book are the seven seals, and each seal broken will bring hardship and woe to the inhabitants of the earth. As uh, the Lord breaks these seals off of this book, it will bring woe to the inhabitants of this earth. Seal the seven seals. Seven, of course, is the number of complete. It's a complete book. God's Never not completed something. He always completes what he does. He's the ark and things are in our face, the Bible says. He's a God of complete. So he's never not completely finished something. Then he starts. He opens and no man closes. He closes and no man opens. He sets in motion. I thought this was a good thought. He sets in motion events that man has no control over. But when this great tribulation period starts, it will kick off events that man has no control over. People, mankind, they like to think they're in control, but God is still in control. Let the book read. That verse says, He saw that it is a book written within. Now, every book has to have an author. The author of this book, of course, is the Lord. This book we notice is a held by God. It's in His right hand. Now, that's a place of promise. When you read the Bible, and when you read about God, and it's talking about Him, it always mentions His right hand. 
It's a place of promise. It's a place of power. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. When Jesus, when he ascended to the Father, he sat down on the Father's right hand. It's a place of promise. Nobody else has ever sat down on the right hand of God. As a matter of fact, go back in Hebrews. It says to which of the angels did he say at any time, Sit thou on my right hand? He's, Jesus is higher than the angels. He's higher than everybody. He belongs in that place of promise. Hallelujah. So it's on the Lord, the God, the Father's right hand. It's a place of promise. The practical lesson for us is the Word of God should hold a prominent place in our lives. The Word of God, I believe, should be in our right hand. I try to keep a copy of God's Word in, in my vehicle that I drive. I keep a copy of the Bible. I go to the Bible. I go to the King James Bible. I carry it in my dinner bus to work every day. They have one of my moms for every one of them. Of course, I've got plenty of them at night. But I like to have a copy of God's Word. At my right hand. And nowadays we have our cell phones. We can pull up. If you've got access to the internet, we can pull up a uh, device and read it and listen to it. It's one of the wonderful uh, things that that is. The Word of God can hold a prominent place in our lives. And it's written within. And it's written within. Uh, and on the back side it's sealed. It speaks of the completeness of the revelation. So these succeeding chapters uh, inform us the book has to do with the future, uh, with the future, the judgment of the wicked and the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. He tells the six seals, the seven seals, and what that tells the city is a secure book. Verse number two, he said that I saw a strong name proclaimed with a loud voice. Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Here he is, a strong name, standing in hell. He's making a proclamation. Who's worthy to open the book and loose the seals thereof? He said, I saw a strong name. He makes that fast to uh, evidently the force of the scripture strong. Tells us, number one, that strength is needed to open this book. It's going to take strength to open this seal. It's going to take something else. Secondly, it's not only going to take strength, it's going to take worthiness. Notice he said, who is worthy to open this? Worthy. It indicates worthiness is needed to open the book. Worthiness of a spiritual character. To such extent, it would render the extraordinary strength needed to open the book. So where does strength come from? For the Lord Jesus, it comes from his worthiness. Oh, he's worthy to that. He's the one that's worthy to open this book. And it's a worthy book. The strong angel asks the question, who is worthy to open and loose the seal? Now, the question to us is, why would God ask such a question when God already knows the answer? I believe it's because he wants to uh, to remind mankind, for mankind to acknowledge our unworthiness and the worthy one, Christ, be exalted. Our unworthiness, verse number three, notice, and no man in heaven nor in earth, 
Neither under the earth was able to open the book. Neither the book thereon. So that there's nobody found that can open it. Or even look upon it. They couldn't look in it if they got it open and understand even what it says. I believe what it says. The word man here means no human being. Look upon man not just to gaze upon in the physical sense, but to understand what it says. And I thought about this. <clears throat> he said no man in heaven. So think about all the great men that are in heaven. Wow. There, there's a lot of great people in heaven. There's uh, 12 patriarchs, Abraham, Moses, David, the prophets, 12 apostles. Lots of what we would consider great men in heaven. But uh, no man in heaven, nor in earth, nor under the earth. Now here's a sobering thought. There's no man in heaven. There's no man in the earth, the great, the powerful, the rulers, generals, the armies, business leaders, poor figures. But here's the soul that thought, these are under the earth. Do you realize tonight there's great men in hell? There are great men tonight. I thought about this before I left the house. I was looking over this. There are great men that accomplished great things upon this earth that rejected Jesus, that rejected the blood of Christ. They were great in every aspect of their life, but spiritually they were all the great men in hell tonight. I thought that was so great for all. Surrender power. Great men but only unworthy men. Not only unable to open the book, but unable to even look thereof. Mm. Verse number four. And I will not, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. That's the wonder of the book. God, he wanders. What was in the book? He wept when no one was found worthy. And, and so this notes John's spiritual condition. He wept much. And you say, Why did John wait much? He had a desire to know what was in that book. That seven that sealed book. Oh, there he was. That, I believe that was his spiritual condition. He had a desire to know what was in the book. And uh, at that time, apparently he thought that it would never be open because no one was found worthy. Verse number 5 says, And one of the elders said unto them, We know, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. The line, tribe of Judah. Now, let me say this. He, he says there in verse number five, one of the elders. The elders represent the church in the book of the Revelation. Uh, the good news of the gospel is spread by men, not angels. And so here, one of the elders, not an angel messenger, but an elder, tells God the we know privilege is determined by God, but it always brings responsibility. He said to us, we not. Now, let's notice the thing. God set money. He's holding the seven sealed book. The angel broke light. Nobody's found worthy. And then one steps forward the book. It brings joy when Jesus comes forward. We know, John. We know. Jesus is stepped forward. He's great in the joy. He's going to open the book. Notice now he says the line. Now he says there the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, 
verse number 6, the Lord Jesus is identified as a lamb. In verse number 5, he's identified as a lion. And so the lamb is first identified as a lion. Uh, this is not contradicting. The lion speaks of the rule of Christ, while the lamb identification, identification speaks of redemption through Christ. And so here the line speaks of the majesty and the kingliness of Christ. And the root of David, the lineage of Christ, is he came from the tribe of Judah. I, I thought that thought opened that up from the Jewish. Here he is, the line of the tribe of Judah. His majesty, his kingliness. And then the root of David, his wings, the wings of Christ, he came from the, the tribe of Jesus. And so Christ prevails. Jesus himself opens the book by listening to the seven seals. In the context of Scripture, the word here translated prevail, I thought this was interesting, the word translated prevail is the same word translated overcome in the letters to the seven church. And so we see here the lion, the tribe of Jesus, the root, the offspring of David. He's overcome. He broke these seven kings. And now this is interesting to verse number five. When we look at how Christ is described here in this verse, the lion of the tribe of Judah this is the only place in Scripture where we find this terminology. So what are the characteristics of the lion or kingly, God of the power? And, uh, of course, the, the root of David. We can reference Isaiah. Let's see if I got any more. Isaiah 11, 1 through 4. Nor shall come forth the rock out of the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of the root. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now notice this. This is very interesting. We talk about the above seven spirits of God that are the fourth throne. I think this portion of the scripture right here uh, opens up some insight on the above seven spirits that he's talking about. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of him and might. The spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord shall make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge right to the side of the eyes, and to the true right for the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he trust the Lord, the true with uh, equity uh, for the meat of the earth, and shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wind. That speaks in the
We'll get to see him with our eyes, not through the eyes of another. You ever saw a really great person? I mean, I don't, uh, I don't recollect I've ever saw a president. I don't know if I've ever. I, I did see the governor of the state one night. I can't remember which one of them was. I think it was the governor. I don't remember. I didn't see too many great people in my life. But whenever you see somebody great standing, I, you know who the great people in my life was? Great. When I was growing up, we'd have services. The men of God, we called them the men of God, would stand up. Those were the great heroes in my life. But when we get to heaven, can you imagine seeing Jesus the second night? All in the middle of it. Hallelujah. Oh, I appreciate that tonight. Let me see where I'm at here. Man, we're going to see. We know the appearance of the lamb. Out of hell, he said, a lamb. Now, where did he go home? In the midst of the throne. We behold the Lamb here in the place of honor. Here in the midst of the throne, therefore, he is the central king. And he's in the midst of the elders. And remember the elders in the church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We see a picture of the church in heaven. And right in the middle of it all is Jesus. I'm glad he's in the middle of us today. I'm glad he's in the middle of us tonight. In the midst of the throne. We behold the Lamb here in the place of honor, and he's in the midst of the throne. That central figure, the midst of the in the midst of the elders, which equals the church. That's the place of his appearance. The posture of his appearance, he stood. Alludes to his resurrection. Revelation chapter number one and verse number 18. He says, I am he that lives from the dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. Now the keys of hell and death. The passion of his appearance says it had been slain, the verse says. This represents the passion of Christ. The crucifixion of Christ is from to all future events. The crucifixion of Christ is promised to all beautiful events for without Christ's crucifixion. None of the future events have come to pass. I never really thought about it like that for this week when I was studying it. Without the crucifixion of Christ, no future events are going to come to pass. When he hung up there, he cried his feet, and it was. The power of his appearance, having seven holes, this denotes the absolute dominating power of Christ. The perception of his appearance, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Christ has the perception of the Holy Spirit. He's all seen, he's all known. He's all him. He's described, and he's described. Verse number five is a lion. Here, verse number six, he's described as a lion. The characteristics of a lamb are humble and obedient. But the lamb, this lamb, was the atoning sacrifice for sin. John the Baptist in John chapter number one and verse number 29, he said the whole of the Lamb of God which take away the sin of the world. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 7, he was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened but not his mouth. He had brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is done, so he opened not his mouth. And notice in the verse, well, no lamb as it had been slain. And this speaks of the type of death. It's a substitutionary death. 
we read about that in Isaiah chapter number 3. Let me read it to you. Isaiah chapter 3, 1 through 7. Who's believed are the Lord? For whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Listen to this. He decides and rejected the man. A man of sorrow is wanted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our grief, carried our sorrow, yet we didn't see him speak. Smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our need. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. The lamb stood, the lamb that was slain, but now the lamb is standing. Hallelujah, he's standing resurrected in the midst of the throne. He's ready to act in judgment. The seven holes they denote de- 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 complete, complete power. The seven eyes denote de- complete knowledge. He's on this, he's all powerful. He's on this, he's all knowledge. His power and knowledge have been sent forth throughout all the earth by his Holy Spirit. His power and his knowledge is sent forth into all the earth. By the Holy Spirit. Verse number seven. That's where we're at. He came in. And he came in and took the book out of the right hand of him and set on the cross. So the one who is regal, the one who's void, the one who's dignified, is the one appropriated by God to take the book. Nobody else is found worthy. Turns to his life. God the Father holds out the book. Jesus walks up. He's appropriated by God to take the book. We see the acknowledgement. He came and took the book. The surrendering of the book acknowledges Christ the Lamb was indeed worthy of receiving, opening and declaring the book. The assurance is this. He came and took the book. If there was ever any doubt in God's mind about the book not being open, most assuredly it's now God. He knows the book will be open now. The Lamb stands now. He, he, he was standing now and moving forward. Uh, he has been the lamb slain for the church. Now he'll take the book as the line and he'll move forward toward the throne. He'll sit on through the tribulation period. He'll take this book, start the judgment upon the world. He judges and writes before he reigns and writes. He judges and writes before he reigns and writes. Seven fields were open. Seven vials were poured out. Seven plagues were going to come upon the earth. I might add, he's the only one worthy to stand before God's throne. The only one worthy to take the book. And this is a note, Daniel chapter number 7, verse 13 and 14. They correspond to this verse and teaching for the sake of time. I'm not going over the earth. Verse number 8, And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four, and twenty elders fell down before the land, and every, every one of them all, golden vials full of oaths, which are the first of Christ. All them priors that you've been praying about many years, them priors you prayed 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 10 years ago, don't remember none of them. I don't. I mean, you've been praying every day for 
for a long time down through the years, we can't remember all this for our chance. Guess what? You know what the Lord's doing? Up our hands. I'm waiting to talk. He's still a savior. He says there are four, the four of twenty hills. Every one of them having hearts and a golden Bible. Every one of them else. They got golden Bible. God, what are you doing in collecting them for us? Them for our coming God's sure we collect. He's looking at Earth for our Jesus. Earth for our Jesus. Earth for our today. Earth for our life. Well, Earth is a prior from Christian mind. This is how it is. You're aware of it. And that file is his book. He's going to put it back and he's going to say it. Now that time comes. Now, four and twenty elders go to four. They're going to four and prior to that. It's a sweet savor of the Lord, I believe. The old is what this thing. Golden vows full of odors with all the pride of the sign. Now go, all my. The resounding echoes of heaven are that of one. We saw Christ standing and moving forward in now, completing the task, saving the book, taking over it with the four and twenty beasts, the four, the four beasts, the four and twenty elders, and us will be there, and all else. Fall down before him. Now they hark the no pray, and they go to Bible full of old and sort of prayers and signs. Listen to Psalm 141. Chapter, chapter 141, verse number 2. Let my prayer be set before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. <coughs> oh, Glory to God. But thank God, I know we probably run away. Our prayers are sitting up to him. Let my prayer be set before me to them sin. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Verse number 8, we also see the members of the choir, that's the four babies, the four twenty elves. We see the music of the choir, that's the heart. We see the meditation. Now, would you say, Richard, what's the meditation? They're singing a new song. It says there in verse number nine. A new song in the sense of the progress of the plan of God. The old songs are the creation. What the, we sing a lot about creation, creation, power, what God does. The old songs, the songs of Moses, the creation songs, the songs of victory, sung by the children of Israel, etc. The new song is that of victory of redemption. It's of the supremeness of Christ. Thou art worthy. It's of his of slain. He was the lamb slain from the foundation. Well, that's Calvary. He says, Thou hast redeemed us by his blood, by thy blood. That's the salvation. And then there's the service. The service is in verse number 10. Thou hast made us unto God, kings and priests, that we shall reign upon the earth. Verse number 11, And I was healed, and I heard the voice of many angels, Round about the cross. And the beast and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, 
Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now here, all heaven resigned. All heaven. And they say worthy. With one voice, they're all saying worthy is the Lamb. That was slain. And I just noticed the word. He was slain to receive power. He was slain to receive riches. Slain to receive wisdom. Slain to receive strength. He was slain to receive honor. He was slain to receive glory. Slain to receive blessing. We wonder about the slain of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Why was he slain? Here it gives us an example. Why he was slain? John saw and heard voice many angels. Verse number 12, verse 8, with a loud voice, heaven is going to be a loud voice. And in innumerable numbers, and they are all saying the same thing at the same time. Heaven is a orderly place, a place no confusion. They say, worthy is the Lamb. This is Christ receiving the Jew of the Lord's praise for all. Then there is power, that great word is diamonds, which is where we get our words of diamonds. It means power, it means explosive power. <laughs> Say that we have not yet fully realized. Christ's will is all his power in the uh, in, in the coming phase of the cross, you like never before, there are riches, fullness and abundance, absolute fullness of uh, possession, there is wisdom is full of knowledge, there is strength, there is ability to force, and might to force, there is honor, there is glory, there is blessing. And then in verse number 13, and every creature, notice this, this is the, the, the heading of my Bible. It says the universal adoration of the Lamb who is King. I like that. Now, the animals are going to play the praise of God. I can't get nothing else out of this. I, I, I read this. It says every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them. All means all. Heard I say, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Can we get anything else out of that? Every creature at this point in time they're going to say worthy is the Lamb. They're all going to do. Place and honor, glory, pride, be it to him that sit us one from. And it's the land forevermore. Verse number 14, before they say this, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that lived forever and forever. Let's stand. Follow Jesus, man. Lord, thank you tonight. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us for just a little while. Lord, thank you. Then one day we're going to see what we're reading about. We're going to see you as a lamb that was slain, standing in the midst of the sun. We thank you for that, Lord. Lord, now I pray for every individual that's here tonight. I pray for the blessing. Give them a special blessing. Lord, now through the coming week, I pray for help to keep us safe. Lord, there's a lot uh, going on. We got our Independence Day uh, here coming up. And uh, God, I pray to keep us safe, please, for our family during this time. God, do you do that? Lord, take care of us, Lord, please. Lord, now what you do for us? Isn't it?